We will now in this presentation finish up the this week's block of scripture for the Come Follow Me lessons by now discussing things in Romans chapter 13 through chapter 16. Romans 13, be subject to God's ministers. Romans 13, 1 through 7, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. The Joseph Smith translation of Romans 13, 1 through 7 indicates that Paul's statements in these verses apply to following not only civic authorities, but also church authorities. For example, in Joseph Smith's translation, Romans 13, 1, the prophet Joseph Smith added the words, in the church. There is no power in the church, but of God. In Joseph Smith's translation, Romans 13, 4, sword was changed to rod. And in the Joseph Smith translation, Romans 13, verse 6, tribute, taxes, was changed to your consecrations. These verses also contain some of the clearest New Testament descriptions of a disciple's civic responsibility. There were good reasons for Paul to counsel Christians to be subject to civil authorities. Roman rulers placed a high priority on maintaining peace and quelling social unrest and revolt were put down swiftly and violently. Early or in Paul's ministry, unrest in the Jewish community in Rome had led to the expulsion of all Jews from the city for a time. Paul gave specific instructions about civic duties to help the church avoid harm in potential volatile circumstances. See verses 6-10 through 13 13 13-14. Paul's counsel to be subject unto higher powers, Romans 13-1, reflects the principle of the 12th article of faith. We believe in being subject to kings, presidents, rulers, and magistrates, and obeying, honoring, and sustaining the law. By describing civil authorities as being ordained of God and God's ministers, Romans 13, 1 and 6, Paul acknowledged that all who hold positions of power are accountable to God, and they hold power only to the extent that God allows them. As to the verses applying to the church authorities, Elder Bruce R. McClunky states, To gain salvation, the saints must be subject to God's ministers. The doctrines and ordinances of the gospel cannot be separated. To gain salvation, the saints must be subject to God's ministers. I I apologize, I I repeated that. The doctrines and ordinances of the gospel cannot be separated from those appointed to teach Christ's gospel and perform his ordinances. Those who accept the gospel do so by submitting to the will and dedication of Christ. They come to the legal administrators who teach the doctrines of Christ and who perform the ordinances of salvation in his name and by his authority. God's truth cannot be accepted in an abstract and impersonal way. They must always be taught by someone sent of God. How shall they preach except they be sent? Romans 10, 15. And gospel ordinance cannot be formed except by commissioned servants, empowered so to act by their master. It is an, in, it is an eternal, in varying verity, that salvation seekers must submit to the direction of those whom God has placed over them in his kingdom. Otherwise, they cannot be saved. The saints, therefore, must be subject to God's ministers. Uh, Always in righteousness, we are not under any obligation to follow anyone in unrighteousness. Conformity to church discipline sacrifices the soul or sanctifies the soul. I will prove to you all things whether you will abide in my covenant even unto death that you may be found worthy, the Lord said in Doctrine and Covenants 98.14. The Lord's covenant or gospel is always administered by those whom he has appointed so to act. And as a consequence, the saints are bound to take counsel and direction from them. Thus, when the president of the church, the state president, the bishop, or any duly commissioned officer counsels those over whom he presides to follow a certain course, the church members involved must do so at the peril of losing their salvation. 
pulse pronouncement as restored to its original state by the inspired version so specifies. Love is fulfilling the law. Many attributes and feelings are embraced in gospel love, devotion, adoration, reverence, tenderness, mercy, compassion, condescension, grace, service, solicitude, gratitude, kindness. Love's chief manifestation is seen in the grace of God as this is found in the infinite and eternal atonement. Romans 8, 13, 8, free yourself from all debt except to love one another. Men are commanded to love God and their fellow man. Failure so to do is disobedience and therefore sin. Men owe a debt of love to deity and to their fellow beings, and through love they obey or keep or fulfill the law. In Romans 13, 10 Paul was saying, those who truly love their fellow mortals thereby, thereby automatically keep all the commandments, which obedience constitutes total conformity to or fulfillment of the whole law. Romans 13, 11, now is our salvation nearer than we believed. We are nearer the goal of salvation now than when we first accepted the gospel. We have made progress along the path leading to eternal life. Through continued obedience, we have acquired more of the attributes of godliness and become more Christ-like. That is only true is if we're on the path and working on it. Since salvation consists in having the character, perfections, and attributes of deity, and since all things are governed and controlled by law, it is a self-evident truth that some people are nearer to gaining eternal life than are others. Some have just entered the gate of repentance and baptism and have thus just started out in the direction of salvation. Others, through long devotional obedience after baptism, have begun to acquire measurably the attributes of godliness, and hence are nearer the goal than they are the newborn babes in Christ. Romans 13.12, the armor of light. Paul's imagery in Romans 13.12 is similar to that found in Ephesians 6.11-17, where he urges readers to put on the whole armor of God. In the Roman passage, Paul admonished readers to cast off the works of evil and to arm themselves with the armor of light, perhaps referring to Jesus Christ, who is the light and life of the world. As the Robert D. Hells of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught, My brothers and sisters, in this the greatest conflict between light and darkness, I am grateful for the opportunity to endure hardness as a disciple of Jesus Christ. With Paul, I declare, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Romans, 12, thir Romans 13, 12. I bear my special witness that Jesus Christ is the light and the life of the world. Yea, the light that is endless, that can never be darkened. In 3 Nephi 1824, we get specifically told what light we are to hold up. In the Sermon on the Mount, remember, he said, Ye are the light of the world. In 3 Nephi 1824, he said, Therefore, hold up your light, that it may shine unto the world. Behold, I am the light which ye shall hold up, that which ye have seen me do. Behold, ye see that I have prayed unto the Father, and ye are all have witnesses. So we are not to be on an ego trip and hold ourselves up. We are to be truly humble and hold up the light of Christ that should be in us through our obedience and submissiveness. Romans 13, verse 14. Make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Paul's counsel to make not provisions for the flesh, Romans 13, 14, reflects the truth that controlling our thoughts is critical to withstanding temptations. The Greek word translated as provision means forethought. When people succumb to temptation, it is often because they have allowed themselves to dwell on the temptation and think about committing the sin. I believe it's in Doctrine and Covenants section 20, I'm not sure of the verse. Around verse 21 or 22, it said, Christ was 
had temptations, but gave no heed to them. President Boyd K. Packer suggested one way we could control our thoughts. When temptation comes, you can invent a, de a delete key in your mind. Perhaps the words from a favorite hymn. Your mind is in charge. Your body is the instrument of your mind. When some unworthy thought pushes into your mind, replace it with your delete key. Worthy music is powerful and can help you to control your thoughts. Doctrine and Covenants 20, 21 through 24. Wherefore, the Almighty God gave his only begotten Son, as it were, in those scriptures which have been given to him. He suffereth temptation, but gave no heed unto them. So there's the proper citation. Romans 14. Our meek drink Sabbath day matters of religion. Romans 14, 1 through chapter 15, verse 3, dealing with doubtful disputations. Paul pointed out that some church members choose to eat all things, while the others choose to eat only herbs, or in other words, vegetables. See Romans 14, 2, footnote A. Those who ate only vegetables were likely Jewish converts, while those who ate other foods were probably Gentile converts. In addition, some church members choose to follow Jewish customs, Systems, practices, and holidays. Romans 14.5 These differences in personal practices led to divisions among saints in Rome and other locations. See Romans 14.3, 1 Corinthians 8, 1-13, and Colossians 2.16 In response to this problem, Paul taught that many personal choices concerning diet and other practices were not addressed by any specific commandment. Therefore, these matters were to be decided between the individual and the Lord. Romans 14, 6-8 Paul taught that we should not impose our private interpretations on fellow members or pass judgment on those who live differently. Romans 14, 10 through 15. On the other hand, church members should consider the effect of their personal practices on others and be willing to forego some actions if they might cause another to stumble spiritually. Romans 14, 13 through 15, and verses 20 through 22. Promoting peace and edification in the church is a higher priority than maintaining personal preferences. Romans 14, 19. And 15, 1 through 3. Some actions and priorities simply matter more than others. Romans 14, verses 17 and 19. Elder Bruce R. McConkie gave these significant insights. Two of the dead performances of the Mosaic Law are here rising, ra raising their ugly heads to plague the Jewish converts in Rome. These are one, the ancient dietary restrictions, such as those prohibited. Hibitations in Leviticus 11 against eating certain animals, fowls, fishes, and creeping things, some 32 of which happened to be prohibited by name, and two, the strict commitment that Israel should observe an appointed weekly Sabbath as a sign and witness that they were the Lord's people. This Sabbath was in commemoration of their deliverance from Egyptian bondage, and as a consequence fell on a different day each week. But now Christ has come, the law is fulfilled, its performances are no longer binding. And as to the Sabbath day, the apostles have now decreed that worship reserved for that day should be referred to Sunday, the Lord's Day, and should be in commemoration of Christ coming forth in the resurrection. However, some of the Jewish converts are apparently not fully envisioning the new order of things are still trying to live the dead law. Also, there seems to be among the Roman saints those who would have other self-imposed and foolish personal rules where eating and drinking are concerned, even as there are word of wisdom fattest in the church today. We must be careful of trying to push on other people, perhaps dead things that are no longer required or important or that are personal interpretations.
Paul's approach to the problem follows the pattern set by the apostle in deciding the question of circumcision, Acts 15, 1 through 35. Since eating and drinking, even some matters connected with Sabbath observance, are not to be compared in importance with the great basic realities of Christianity, such as the divine sonship of Christ, Paul wisely takes a tolerant view. Bear with the weak, he says. It is not their dietary preferences that will save them, but their faith in Christ. Granted that the fattest and the extremists are still worshiping to some extent at the shrine of Moses, yet exhibit Christian, yet exhibit Christian charity towards them. Until they grow in faith, a severe and strict approach may drive them from the fold of fellowship and lose them to the cause. All men are foolish to some extent, and may become a saint to bear with each other that all eventually may be strong and sound and stable, anchored securely on the true foundation of which Christ laid. And as, and as it was in Paul's day, so should it be in ours. Romans 14, verse 1. Faith comes by hearing the truth from the lips of a legal administrator who speaks by the power of the Spirit and not by argument or debate. The spirit of contention is of the devil. Romans 14, 2 through 4. Church members should not condemn and sit in judgment upon each other. Judgment is the Lord's. Romans 14, 5 through 6. It is not the day, but a day that is important in Sabbath observance. Labor on the Sabbath is malum prohibitum and not malum in sin. That is, it is wrong because it is prohibited, not wrong in itself, as in the case, for instance, with murder and stealing. Romans 14, 7 through 9, in life and in death we are the Lord's. He has bought us with his blood. 1 Corinthians 6, 20. Romans 14, 10 through 12, Jehovah said to Isaiah, Look unto me, and ye shall be saved, all ye ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Isaiah 45, 22 through 23. Paul, by the spirit of revelation, quotes from this ancient declaration and applies it pointedly and specifically to Christ, Thus, thus making Jehovah and Christ the same being. Romans 14, 13 to 23. Humor those who are weak in the faith. Let them be word of wisdom fanatics until they learn better. Hold up before them the great spiritual reality that the gospel is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Labor for their perfections, but do not contend. Do not cast them off because they are not yet stable and sound. Romans 14, 23. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. This applies to the saints, to those who have the light, who know that salvation is in Christ, to those who are under covenant to keep the commandments. It is not applicable to the world in general, for sin is not imputed where there is no law. Thus the saints are guilty of sin when they fall short of those high standards they are obligated to obtain. In the field of worldly wisdom, for instance, it is a sin for a Latter-day Saint to use tea, coffee, tobacco, or liquor, but it is not a sin for a non-member of the church to do so. Romans chapter 15, Bear the Infirmities of the Weak Christ, the prototype of all good and perfect things, fellowshiped us as his brethren in our weaknesses and with our infirmities. Now we should fellowship each other, those who are strong in the faith, helping the weak, bearing their spiritual shortcomings until all are like-minded and have become one with each other. Romans 51, President Gordon B. Hinckley relayed an example of strong members of the church bearing the infirmity of one who felt weak. Remember, we are not alone. We belong to a great body of friends, thousands upon thousands, who are striving to follow the teachings of the Lord. I remember interviewing a discouraged missionary. He was having trouble with the language, which was not his own. He had lost the spirit of the work and wanted to go home. He was one of 180 missionaries in that mission. 
I told him that if he were to go home, he would break faith with his 179 companions. Every one of them was his friend. Every one of them would pray for him, fast for him, and do almost anything else to help him. They would work with him. They would teach him. They would get on their knees with him. They would help him to learn the language and be successful because they loved him. I am happy to report that he accepted my assurance that all of their other missionaries were his friends. They rallied around him, not to embarrass him, but to strengthen him. The terrible feeling of loneliness left him. He came to realize that he was a part of a winning team. He became successful, a leader, and he has been a leader ever since. That's what each of us must do for one another. Paul wrote to the Romans, We then are that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. And then he added these significant works, words, and not to please ourselves. Romans 15, 1. Romans 15, 1 through 3. Those who are Christ are called upon not to please themselves, but to serve each other, even as he served us. Romans 15, 4. Being diligent in the study of the scriptures can bring patience, comfort, and hope. 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 17 says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and thou hast assured of, none of whom thou hast learned them, and as that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for correction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Romans 15, 6, one mind and one mouth. This is reminiscent of Moses chapter 17, verse 18, which says, And the Lord called his people Zion, because they were of one heart and one mind, and dwelt in righteousness, and there was no poor among them. Well, they were one with whose heart and whose mind? Christ, not each other's. We will all not all agree on everything. But if we all focus on Christ, we can become one heart and one mind in him and still have our individuality. 1 Corinthians 1 verses 1 through 11 state, Paul called me an apostle of Jesus Christ to the will of God and so Sinethus, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place called upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours, grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father, and from, our, from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you become behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that you may be blameless in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no division among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Christ is more interested in our unity than in diversity. He wants us to be unified. Romans 15, 8, Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision. How can this be since Christ came to fulfill and replace the ancient order? Since it was he who said, the law of circumcision is done away in me. Moroni 8, 8. Paul's explanation, both wondrous and inspiring, says he, Jehovah who gave the law of circumcision is Christ, and in his mortal ministry he came both to confirm and to fulfill his own law. Romans 15.9, as proof of this exposition, 
Paul states further, says further, it was Christ speaking anciently under his designation as the great Jehovah who said his gospel would go to the Gentiles. Romans 15, 9-12. Paul cites Psalms 18, 19. Deuteronomy 32, 43. Psalms 117, verse 1, and Isaiah 11, 1 and 10 to show that nations other than Israel, meaning Gentile peoples, were de de destined to receive the gospel. Romans 15.2, Root of Jesse. The stem of Jesse spoken of by Isaiah is Christ as the root of Jesse. Behold, thus saith the Lord, it is a descendant of Jesse as well as Joseph, unto whom rightly belongeth the priesthood and the keys of the kingdom for an ensign and for the gathering of my people in the latter days. Doctrine and Covenants 113.6 Romans 15, verses 13, 19, and verse 27. Now as the crowning proof that the gospel had gone and should go to the Gentiles, Paul names some of the gifts and graces which God has poured out upon them. They have received the power of the Holy Ghost and are full of goodness and knowledge. Their offerings are sanctified by the Spirit, and they are partakers of spiritual things, among them by faith, signs, and wonders and mighty miracles have been wrought, the lame to walk, the blind to see, the dead are raised, none which could have happened without God's sanction and power. Romans 15.30 Strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. Prayers which God hears are not perfunctory ritualistic recitations. They should manifest the striving and strugglings of the soul. Mormon says men should pray with real intent of heart and with all the energy of heart. Mormon 7, 9, 48. Let's now go to Romans chapter 16. Paul salutes diverse saints. Romans 16, 1 through 2, Phoebe. At the close of his epistle, Paul highly commended a church member named Phoebe, who was evidently the messenger who carried Paul's epistles to the saints in Rome. From Paul's description of Phoebe, we learn that she was a servant of the church, which is at Centuria, and that she had been a succor or benefactor of many members of the church, including Paul, Romans 16, 1-2. Phoebe is an example of the important and trusted role women have in the church. Paul's written approval of Phoebe is an example of the early Christian practices of carrying letters of recommendation when traveling to another Christian congregation. This custom is similar to the current church practice of transferring membership records and carrying temple recommends. Romans 16, 3-16 Words of greeting, commendation, and warning are here sent by Paul to his special friends and fellow laborers in Rome to those who had struggled and suffered with him in spreading the truth, to those who in effect were to him as Elisha who poured water on the hands of Elijah. Among those named are several women and representative of various nations. Shall not all these favored ones receive light, glory, and reward in the kingdom of glory with the apostles whose fellow witnesses they are? Romans 16, 1, the, a servant of the church, all are not so designated who hold position in the church and who labor diligently. Or I, I'm sorry, I should read that as a question. Are not all those so designated who hold position in the church and who labor diligently? Romans 16, 2, one saint succors another, and he a third, and so the goodness of the gospel spreads among all who receive it. Romans 16, 4, Romans 16, 4, the churches of the Gentiles, congregations, wards, branches, or stakes established among the Gentiles. Romans 16.5, the church that is their house. How often small struggling branches of church meeting in the homes of faithful members, pending the time when growth and strength permit the direction of a house of worship. Romans 16.7, Paul had kinsmen who had joined the church before he did. Kinsmen who bore apostolic witness of the divinity sonship and who held positions of note among the brethren. Romans 16, 17, avoid cultists. See Acts 20, 22, I'm sorry, Acts 20, 28 through 32. 
Take heed therefore unto yourselves and unto all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after many departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn every one night and day with tears. And now, brother, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give, and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Paul was warning them of the future apostasy that was about to begin. Romans 16, verse 19. Simple, con simple concerning evil. The saints have no need to learn of sin. So often a knowledge of evil becomes an invitation to sin. Romans 16, 20. Bruce Satan under your feet. Those who overcome the world trample Satan under their feet by rejecting his enticings. Conversely, those who reject Christ and his counsel trample thereby trample him under their feet. Romans 16, 25 through 26. According to the commandment of the everlasting God, as revealed to the apostles and as foretold in the scriptures, the gospel is now for all nations. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this presentation, hit the like button and consider subscribing to the channel.